Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're learning about the translation of Hawaiian language newspapers from the 1800s. Dr. Puakea Nogomeyer and his team of graduate research assistants from the University of Hawaii Institute for Hawaiian Language Research and Translation are working to find references to freshwater use in the old newspapers. They're hoping that these references will add to researchers' knowledge base about how freshwater was used back in time and how that use has changed as Hawaii has developed. The Ikivai project is trying to form an understanding of Hawaii's freshwater resources, how much freshwater we have in our underground aquifers, and also an understanding of how much freshwater we used to have. And the change over time is an important component going forward in modeling how we use freshwater in modern day and how we might manage our freshwater resource as our population grows into the future. We've actually documented there's maybe a million and a half pages just of newspaper material if it was typed out. Wow. We have used, touched, published, translated maybe three or four percent. Ninety-seven percent, ninety-six percent of this has not been articulated into our world today. It's far more than what you think of as a newspaper today. Uh -huh. So it's, it's so many other forms of media, forms of archiving, all in one. So to open up that body is gonna take a few decades. <laughs> we gotta have young people to do it because it's, it's going to last for generations to, to reconnect it up. The revitalization movement has focused on very modern language for the most part. Ah. And so while there are words for computer, there are words for astronauts, there are, you know, very modern day-to-day -day kind of material um, is built into the vocabulary of all of the second language, the kids who are learning Hawaiian today. Mm -hmm. But there's really a lot of both grammar structure and vocabulary that had fallen into disuse because there was a hundred years where Hawaiian wasn't vibrant. This um, cache of language material gives a different sort of window into the history of Hawaii. So it makes reference to events and people and things that has never been available in the English record. So it's unfamiliar to modern, whether they're language speakers or not, it's unfamiliar. And what time frame are we talking about? Well, the newspapers run from 1834 to 1948. So what they do is they, yeah, they allow sort of this uh, chronology with all of its referential material that illuminates, there's a lot of other government document, manuscript material that lies out there and it's decontextualized. Well, this allows you to put that into a context. So it's actually, the newspapers become the focus and that's where we start. But that allows us to know that other material might be there Sure. or it makes other material that we happen to trip across able to be placed either, you know, location, person, time. The newspapers are definitely our focus. And because that's the biggest resource that's been opened up recently, is the digitizing of the newspapers, making them searchable, made it really clear how important that record is. And can you tell me a little bit about how that came about? Sure, and, and it's a great story and it's very unique to Hawaii, is that, of course, Hawaii meets up with the world at large, 1778 starts consistent interaction, but there may have been interaction before, okay? But for 40 years, they're playing with the world at large and lots of change is going on, whatnot. 1820, their language is made writable. So suddenly there's a, it's reduced to writing, and they embrace literacy like no place else did. They've watched the power of that, and really Hawaiians were in a position that all of the new things that came, they could get them. They could get anything that was on the ships. You can trade for it, you can barter for it, you can just simply demand it. They couldn't get reading and writing. Uh -huh. Nobody was here with the skill set. Nobody was here long enough. The missionaries were the first permanent group with the skill set. So that's what made it happen in 1820. So 
it, within a year, they get the, the language into a viable writing system. Within one year. And that's because <laughs> the missionaries who came here were actually scholars on their own. They weren't just zealots, right? So they came with a skill set. And they're working with the best of the Hawaiians, right? Hawaii, because of the organization, it's a nation state already. It's very easy to simply demand you will be assigned to these people. So they had the best of helpers. So within a year, and actually I have an example of the, the pia pa was the way that it was set down. And they made the, the spoken language so connected to the written language that actually a, a fluent speaker could learn to read and write in 18 hours is a reference that, you know, uh, which is a few weeks of study if oh you're doing it goodness. an hour a day. It's pretty remarkable, so they pick up on it really fast. Now they start teaching Hawaiians in English because that's all they know. Right. But in the course of the year that there's this whole, it's a really pretty dynamic year apparently. Within the year they, they move it over to Hawaiian and we have letters, I want to show you some, that in January, it's, it's sort of, you know, uh, crystallized into this will be the form. Six months later, we have the queen writing this elegant letter in Hawaiian to one of the other queens, you know, who obviously <laughs> could, has, read has, it. could read it and understand it. And she's complaining about, come on, I want more letters. <laughs> Get me more letters. I will pull that up for you because that's sort of the, if you understand the dynamic sort of vibrancy of that literacy movement that happens here, and nowhere else. The whole nation steps in. The king says, I want everyone literate. But they don't just say it. They build schools, they demand teachers, they make everyone who owns land has to supply the school, has to provide for the teachers. So it moves really fast. It's not until 1834, so they're a dozen, 14 years into it, that the first newspaper comes out. Within 20 years, that becomes a national institution where they depend on readers to be the writers for the content. And they're pleading with, now remember the population is diminishing somewhat, you know, every year. They're saying, those of you who are knowledgeable, this is a safe place to put this information. Please, the stories, the histories, the, so it becomes the national repository. So it's news, it's entertainment, it's everything, but it's also the safe place. Hawaiians didn't invest a great deal in books. It's interesting. They did books for teaching and they did books for education, things like that. Um, there's only a dozen sort of layman's books that were created in Hawaiian because books, right or wrong, are still on the shelf next year. And the newspapers allowed an interactive sort of element that resonates really well with an oral society. Sure. Is that, yeah, when you present something in the newspaper, that high literacy made people very cautious about what they presented. Give your best quality, as everyone can read it. But it also made readers very discerning. Because if I read something that's wrong, I know everyone else read it too. So I'm more likely to step in and say, this needs fixed. So we find the newspapers are so interactive, we'll find some remarkable data bit. But you have to check for the next two <laughs> weeks sometimes two months, to make sure no one added to it, corrected it, changed it. Because oftentimes, any, any piece that is of import may have a periphery of reaction, response, addition, subtraction, you know. So it's really, the newspapers were this kind of living and breathing thing. They're, they are what the web <laughs> is to us today in, in many ways. It was the, the communicator, the, the entertainer, it was the repository. So it's really, it, it, the analogy is really strong, is that this created a national consciousness. I mean, that's sort of the big picture of how it all fits uh -huh. someplace. Do you want to see how it works? Of I can take it, come <laughs> see. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. 
Welcome back. We get the chance to sit down with researchers mining through the Hawaiian language newspapers, which date back to the early 1800s, and learn how they find references to topics of current interest. Right now, they're looking for examples of freshwater use in the Eva Plain of Oahu and the Kona Coast of the Big Island of Hawaii. For this project, for, can you talk a little bit about Ikevai and how you might choose those particular pieces to work on? Mm, well, we launched in with Ikevai and they've identified the areas that they're particularly um, connected with. We're looking for anything dealing with water. Now, we find stuff for the whole archipelago, of course, about water. Some of that is pertinent. So we have to evaluate all of that. But we're looking for places and particular water sources within the regions that they're studying. We're also working with the folks in all the fields within the Ikebai project to sort of allow them access to whatever Hawaiian their things they're running across, their understanding of pieces. Society was limited to where water was accessible. But with new technologies, especially artesian wells, were a a new concept. So there's lots of stories about that because that all happened while the Hawaiian language was still much the language of communication. So I think U'i's been working there on a story where Moku Ume Ume, which is Ford Island, which is a little desert island in the middle of uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, there was an artesian well dug there to support the life on the, the isle, and it was there. They were able to tap into underground resources. Wow. So, yeah, no, there's, and that was recorded in the Hawaiian papers. I know that I just saw an article this morning, and it was about the sugar industry was changing the flow of water and diminishing what was accessible to the taro fields. So, and that's the beginning of that whole shift that was going on. That's the 1860s, 1870s. Lots of that is documented here. And to be able to get clear from the time uh -huh. information is going to be very useful, I think. This is a set of letters on sort of another project. Um, we were working with the Mission Houses Museum. These are letters from the various chiefs to the missionaries from the time of 1820 when writing starts to happen. And I mentioned this one letter is just so, to me, very Are they important. organized by people there? Yeah, that was chiefly names. And so under Ka'ahu Manu, who was the favorite wife of Kamehameha, and then at his death became the regent. He's a sort of co-sovereign with his son, in a way. You can barely make out Waimea. She's still using the old calendar. So Mahoi Hope is like later July, early August, sort of um, 1822. Aroha, so even the L and R are still going to blend. This is her letter to one of the young queens, and she says, Say hi to my boy and you know, all my girls. My boy is the king, yeah? <laughs> and to all my, yeah. And she says, you're there uh, and we're well. That's important because, you know, health is a big issue. So everybody here is well, no illness going on. But she says, you know, got your letter. <laughs> One letter and there's three of us. I want more letters. And she says, and, and people snicker, but she says, you're there with that cluster of long necks. Get some letters out. That's the missionary wives were referred to as long necks because the bonnets that they wore, you know, sort of accented the, the neck. So she says, we want this literacy. It will make us wise. And she actually says in here, I want 800 letters. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's not real clear whether, but she says Hawaiian letters. So I'm not sure if she wants 800 of this so she can distribute, or she wants everybody on deck write <laughs> these bloody letters. Because our next line is, we want the teaching of literacy, it'll make us wise. This is really important in my mind. She's writing the letter, introducing her husband, whose name is Kaumwali'i. He was the king of Kauai. You know Kaumwali'i, right? But look, he signs his name, Tamori, which is how it's been written for 15 years by all the visiting captains and whatnot. But he crosses it out and now applies the new spelling system where sound should match the written word, taumuari'i. He is letting go of the received and applying, implementing the new method. We're like in the minute. 
were on that. That's how. <laughs> on that letter, and, he crosses on it out. On this letter, yeah. that's his own name, and he's applying the new technology. How awesome is that? Not that I was surprised, but I don't think that I understood how incredibly valuable this repository was. This is a world we did not have access to. And it's because the whole history that has been written, everything that you learned, whether you went to Kamehameha School or Punahou or Iowa, everything that was written about Hawaii was drawn from the English language resources. And this was totally overlooked. So it's not that the history and the culture and everything that we learned was wrong. It was that it was fractional. Uh -huh. It's like if we had today modern Hawaii described only by, I don't know, you know, Canadian visitors. <laughs> it's not that they'd be wrong, but how could they possibly get the whole picture? You know, actually, I think 50 years from now, much of this will be so integrated that books will be rewritten. I, I, I can guarantee the history books science books, they'll be rewritten to simply incorporate it. I'm um, the only graduate research assistant for Ikevai right now. We'll hopefully bring on another one. So right now I'm looking at series like Navahi Pano, Eva, anything that we've deemed related, and I'm um, reading the articles in Hawaiian and anything that's related, put aside to translate um, later. Basically look for anything about water, and then after that we'll take it a step further, a step further, until we can get more specific. Um, when Ikevai lets us know like a more specific area or a specific aquifer, we can look more specifically in those areas. So for me right now, I'm focusing more on place rather than, I guess, scientific groundwater terms, you could say. That's not really something we can like just pull up on Papa Kilo and get a hit for. Well, I'm actually was um, raised in Waialua, but my family is from Eva. And I don't know anything about Eva, um, unfortunately, except for that my family was from here. So I'm having a lot of fun reading about this place, especially because it's so different from what it used to look like and it's always changing. My family's native Hawaiian and no one in my family speaks Hawaiian. Um, so I felt like it was my huge responsibility to learn. I started learning in high school and um, came to UH to actually teach special education. And then just got, in taking Hawaiian language classes, fell in love and got really inspired um, by my teachers and decided to change that to my major. 10 years ago, if you told me I was working for Ike Vai doing like research on groundwater, I'd be like, that sounds horribly boring, <laughs> but it's not. It's really, really amazing. And, I'm just excited to be a part of it. I kind of just assumed all the research and everything I would be doing would be about Hawaiian stuff or about Hawaiian places or researching stories. And when Anoi and Puakea approached me with this, I realized how huge of a scope it was and it got me really excited. You know, I don't have a scientific mind. I don't study groundwater or anything like that, but I'm being exposed to all this new knowledge and it's making me realize that um, my Hawaiian language is also teaching me all, all sorts of other things and it's just, making me realize how much opportunity it is. Creating a translation is a lot like kind of creating a hypothesis in that way, is you're starting with something and you refine and you refine and you test and you test until you get this end result. That's kind of how I feel like working with translations with Puakea is my first draft is probably gonna be weird, not make a whole lot of sense, sound like it was written in like old Mark Twain English or something. And then as the um, process goes on, you get something that's really valuable and something we can turn in and testable. So there are a lot of parallels for sure. You keep saying that you're not familiar with science, but it sounds to me like you're actually learning science through your study yeah, of the language. That's what I mean. Is if I was just sat down in a you know science class, I probably wouldn't be interested in any of this. But getting to access my language and like these stories and traditions make it so much more interesting learning about it. I think it's so exciting when you bring in Hawaiian language and Hawaiian culture to these science things. The scientific community doesn't realize how valuable like these archives are for scientific knowledge and. Um, accessing historical accounts. So I think it's cool to kind of see that bridge between like the modern science community, they're working towards preserving water and doing that type of thing and using like past knowledge to um, make that bridge. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. This part of it is we've, we've identified an article, we pull it up, we're actually going to now translate it so that we're able to, to do the pair. So you right now we're going to translate 
this original article. Yeah, yeah. How cool, okay. So this is Navahipanao Eva, are the noted spots of Eva. Um, but it says, Iho Nalavale Ia Ikeiwa, that have disappeared today. Or they, yeah, they've become unfamiliar today. And that is unfamiliar as of 1899. So if you're actually looking for a spring, as in a freshwater spring, resource, yeah, um, that's what you want to find. But these articles are actually poetically referring to um, the school of Mahaina Luna as a spring of knowledge, like a well of knowledge. Yeah. So it's not going to give us a description of flowing water. So here we go. Let's. We're on a water issue. Ikebai is all about water, right? Now, how many hits did we have? Two thousand. Two thousand one hundred eighty-four. Well which it might take an hour to even walk through and look at a couple hundred. Uh -huh. I mean, you can walk through a couple of hundred an hour. So that's 10 hours. That's Just what it takes. Just to isolate which ones are worth further inspection. But tell me about this article. What's this out of? What's so that? this came out of Kalahui, Hawaii on May 24th, 1877. A terrifying tsunami at Hilo. It spread over the foundation that was over 100 acres. Okay, so it was that bracket tsunami that slammed and killed five people. I had bodies of, I wasn't sure if it was something I could omit. Mm. Yeah, I think you can. And even this, I think, because it's in the flow of the article, to be able to say, it slammed into and killed five people. And do you need uh, special access to get there? No, or can the it's all public access. And we have been, I have to say, you know, part of the, the way that we emerged up through working with Sea Grant, with JIMA, with the different agencies, and identifying how the value of this is partly because it's been obscure for a century. So we've, on every piece of work we put out, we say this is for public consumption. We will not do any, we will not dedicate our energies to making something that needs passwords to get into and that's, or lives in a file cabinet someplace. That is really, it's an absolute waste of our time. There's way too much going on. We're working at reintegration. So we will only provide the content if it's total public access. So we're really pretty strident about that. And that's the same is gonna be happening with the EK Vite project. So this is the process that they get found. It's like being time travelers, yeah. but never losing. I mean, we're, in, we're doing it on a computer. You know, it's, oh, what's not to like about that? What year is that? Uh, we're looking at 1870. Now we're gonna end up pulling some pieces from the, oh, see. For my family in particular, my grandma grew up in a uh, time where you couldn't speak Hawaiian, and so she never learned. And then my dad, he's kind of in that time period where it wasn't cool to be Hawaiian, so he didn't want to learn. And so they're at a time, or they're at a state in life where they don't want to learn it now, but they see the importance and they, they think it's, it's valuable because now they can have an access point to that by our translations because they would have never been able to understand what was in the newspapers. My dad gets really excited when I talk about some of the things that we find in the newspapers. Um, and sometimes, especially for the EKY project, I grew up um, in, on the Eva side, well, not really Eva, it's kind of central um, in Midilani. But he grew up in Waianae, and so a lot of the stories that we're finding in the newspapers, I can tell him, oh, I found this story. And he's, so sometimes he'll remember, oh yeah, I remember that spot, or oh yeah, we used to do this over there, um, and my grandma would do the same thing. So it's cool to see stories in the newspapers that my parents and my grandparents can relate to. Um, so it kind of just brings it all together.